Welcome everyone. We are back to discussing uh, Grossberg's book, um, Conscious Mind, Resonant, Resonant Brain. And we're gonna skip ahead a little bit to chapter 12. And in fact, just the first, like maybe five or six pages of chapter 12, because uh, that's uh, about a couple of different motor control models, which I thought are sufficiently different from the art-like models and this whole world of perception and categorization, which in some ways gets a little overcooked because I think a lot of people are already very, very familiar with that stuff just from the popularity of machine learning. And so motor control is like a refreshing breath of fresh air. But even Steve himself quickly shifts to art-like models within this, this chapter. So I thought I wanted to just pause and think about these a couple of different motor control related models because I myself wanted to make sure I understood them. Uh, Okay, so just to recap what we talked about before was this idea that you have the sensory transducers, they kind of get split up into these different pieces that get assembled into, in the case of vision boundaries and features and analogous things are happening in the auditory system and in Steve's world, uh, different sorts of features. And then those two things, use e they use each other to fill in and create uh, neural patterns that can be used uh, for categorization, planning, and action. And that was this little thing, sort of dot, dot, dot. Most papers have that sort of thing. But Steve has, in fact, um, talked about this, <laughs> like what action is. So the time has come to talk a little bit about action. Uh, so all of us sort of have this idea of where the motor cortex is. Uh, and uh, But we almost never think about what it needs to do, other than, you know, moving muscle fibers around, which is, you know, captured in these types of figures. And like, there's this feeling of dot, dot, dot. Oh yeah, just move the muscles. Uh, that seems like the easy part, particularly for people who only think about perception and higher cognition. But uh, I think that dwelling on the challenges of motor control can give you certain sort of intellectual tools that you, that even if you're only interested in so-called higher cognition, you can, you can kind of import them. You can, you can, uh, pilfer some very good ideas about real-time responding uh, from motor control. And, uh, oh yeah, okay. So yeah, that, that's the sort of final stage. In fact, that's where neurotransmitters were first discovered, right? Um, so we all kind of have some idea about how this works. There's some interesting quirks. You can only contract a muscle fiber. There's no sort of reverse process, which is, um, and we'll come to how that's dealt with. Um, so why is this a computationally interesting problem? Um, why should why should theoreticians and modelers be thinking about this? Uh, and I would say even the people interested in perception and memory and stuff like that should occasionally think about this because if you believe that the purpose of the brain is to control the body, then whatever it is that you've done with all your fancy stats and this and that, it, it, the output has to be in the of some sort of format that is legible to control of voluntary motion. Um, so I have the, I thought of this metaphor of you have like some sort of map and you have you're planning a trajectory. Let's assume it's a visual trajectory. You're looking at a map, and uh, you can sort of in in case of Google Maps shift that uh, to be to, to a particular sort of rotation of of your coordinate system. Um, and but imagine that you're not yourself doing the walking. You're controlling a remote control with a controller of some sort. So you're sitting in some way, place, and you know different people have different like preferences. Like if you've ever, there are games where you have to do things like this, where you're shown a map and you have to sort of do the uh, move, movements left, right, up, down, whatever. But the coordinates of what you're looking at are different from the coordinates of what you're controlling. So the question is, what are you doing? Um, like some people who are capable of using the fixed, I actually prefer using fixed maps a lot of the time, like not rotated to my point of view, but some people can't use them at all. Like they, they need to have something that can readily map between left and right that on, on the visual map and the left and right commands that they're using for walking or for controlling something. So- It's actually a nice practical example of this, Johan, from, um, from surgery and laparoscopic surgeries where they actually use a little camera to do the movements and work for them. You have to work on the, from the camera's point of view in order to be able to move around properly. But then you have to keep the anatomy in your head as well because the person's static lying on a bed anesthetized. And so 
you've got to like play this game of like, okay, I'm a camera, I'm not myself, I'm this other thing, and I'm moving around this thing that's invariant. And it's really hard to get your head around. In fact, it takes quite a while to like trick your brain into doing it properly. And then as soon as you get it, you're like, oh, that's easy and you can do anything. But it, it actually took quite a lot of training back early on. I mean, I completely lost how to do that now, but oh, 100%. I mean, anyway. That's what's, what's fun about this topic is how on the one hand, for things that we are very you know, well-trained on, it's so easy to do it. And on the other hand, putting in enough training to learn a new mapping of this sort adults rapidly lose the the either the ability or the willingness to put in that kind of um, effort so this was just a way of introducing this issue of what are these transformations that you're doing because uh, they're not even you're not even conscious of them that uh, even when you're using these tools um, for instance and an analogous issue is happening for using your own um, articulators limbs fingers whatever so that's our seg into the, the nature of the problem um, and so um, Steve has was thinking about this right from those early, those late 60s, mid 60s books. And then I think there was a critical mass of data that started to accumulate in the 70s and 80s. And, he, and then uh, once Dan Bullock, who was my advisor, actually uh, joined the department, they kind of started doing quite a bit in this um, direction. So this was, uh, I think, the, one of the first few. In the middle of the 80s, they started publishing together. And uh, this uh, from 88 uh, is a review of uh, specifically focused on certain uh, invariants uh, of movement to do with speed and accuracy. Um, so the question that they're asking is when you have these invariants, particularly in the domain of the velocity of the effector with your hand, for instance, um, what's producing it? You have all these separate muscle fibers and different joints and things like that. How do you get some kind of invariant that's global. That's the question that they ask. And it's quite a thorough paper. I, can only, I can't really do justice to it because they've gone through a whole lot of data and they've also looked at other models. So, so I don't want to say that, like Steve is not necessarily you know, a complete pioneer of this particular domain um, of you know, um, neuroscience slash robotics. Like there are other models that are roughly in this territory. They've added some interesting elements that are quite neat. But uh, I have myself not sort of exhaustively looked at what else is out there, but I'm curious to know what people are up to, and I might look into that later. Um, so here's one example of an invariant, um, which is the velocity profiles for different um, uh, uh, speeds. So if if you are, and different durations of movements, so you have uh, uh, movement to a target at different uh, speeds, and uh, so uh, the first one is just showing how long it takes and then peak velocity will change depending on how quickly you need to move. When you superimpose them, uh, the first pattern that everyone uh, in this uh, field noticed was that they are basically, there's a scale-free component that um, the, the shape uh, is related to the, um, uh, so basically the, it's like kind of like a Weber law phenomenon. Uh, there's another phenomenon here, which is there's that within this broad Weber-like um, scale-free phenomenon, there's a growing symmetry at, for the longer movements, meaning that the short movements are slightly more asymmetrical than long movements. And they actually model this. I won't get into that, but they actually have an interesting explanation for why. So this is one example of an invariant. And there are a couple of others kind of in this good old school psychophysics, you know, careful um, psychometric measurement kind of stuff that you hardly see nowadays, or at least it seems like neuroscience, you know, scientists aren't paying that much attention to this type of data. Which is unfortunate because those are really interesting behavioral constraints on models in addition to neural constraints. Um, so one thing that they that they point out, which uh, I was only dimly aware, aware of as, as an issue to think about, was that sync the nature of synchronous movements. So when you make a movement, there are all these different muscle fibers and articulators and things that are involved, but it seems like this very smooth single gesture. Um, and if you can look into it, there, there's coarse grain data, or like there was at that time, that the articulators are all moving at the same time. The, it's, so it's not the case, for instance. So here they've shown a sort of hypothetical, like if you had two articulators, like joint one and joint two, to, to move something, uh, you could imagine that in order to get to from point A to point B, you sort of max out going in one direction, uh, and then go in the other direction. So you decompose it in that way, or like both the joints move at the same speed, 
And then when one reaches where it needs to be in that dimension, it just has to stop. And for the most part, you don't see this kind of jerky behavior. You, you get something that's roughly a straight line or, or fairly smooth. And the way that that works is that the duration for which each articulator is moving is the same. It's quite an interesting phenomenon that, that these disparate things which have different controllers, different neurons going down to, to, to regulate them are all contracting for the same duration of time, roughly. This, so is, that's, this is actually Emilio Bisi's mm -hmm. uh, work. All the synergy stuff is his big contribution to... Uh, you were talking to him a couple of days ago, right? Right, yes. Right, yeah. So yeah, they cite Bisi a lot um, in this. Uh, yeah, it's very cool stuff. It's not, I mean, it, it, if you look individually at like specific muscle fibers, it doesn't actually hold. So it really is an immersion phenomenon, meaning that uh, the overall effector seems to obey this, the sets of effectors. But if you look at individual muscle fibers, not necessarily. Uh, or there's a little bit of staggering of onsets and offsets and things like that. So it's a nice example of something that you only see at, the glo at a relatively global level. Uh, so yeah, basically what this is showing is that the, the dotted line you see in the middle B2, the trajectory B2 is, is what you typically see uh, where it kind of goes straight or roughly straight. And B3 and B, B1 are examples where both articulators are being moved at the same speed. So you go along the diagonal until one of them reaches the target in that dimension. And so that would end up being a kind of jerky movement. And they talk about how this can actually cause uh, problems with balance. Uh, and so there's a lot of considerations other than you know, the observation for why that's not necessarily a good idea to kind of have some articulators moving and then others sort of idling because they're done. Um, so these groups of, of, uh, of uh, articulators or even muscle fibers that all act together, this is actually a technical term for them, the synergy. This is sort of an overused word now. It's kind of become almost management speak. But uh, one of the big, uh, groups of uh, uh, researchers who used to use this was motor researchers, actually. In fact, I wasn't aware of him, but uh, Nikolai Bernstein in this 1967 book was a pioneer of uh, uh, this way of thinking and this way of talking about synergy. So yeah, so when groups of muscles cooperate, they're said to form uh, a synergy. Uh, whereas muscles controlling shoulder, elbow, wrist, and finger may all contract or relax synergistically. Um, so one synergy, yeah. So it's more or less what I say. Yeah. Um, so one of the basic problems of motor control is to understand how this happens. This um, and one squarely faces the problem that many behaviorally important synergies are not hardwired. This is really cool, but are dynamically coupled. So they're like teams that work very well, like the New Zealand uh, rugby team, but they are you know temporarily associating and they form other teams at other times. Um, but are yeah, yeah, dynamically coupled and uh, decoupled through time in ways that depend on the actor's experience and training. The prospect that the uh, trajectories of all synergies are explicitly pre-planned seems remote. So it's highly unlikely that you've already got, you know, master controllers for every possible team uh, that you could imagine. So synergies are determined by the task and may have no independent existence. Um, so in this uh, 88 uh, Viet, uh, paper, they talk about the origins of movement invariance. And uh, they get into the details of how modelers have attempted to talk about this. And uh, there's two broad species of answer. And to, I think to this day, a lot of people still uh, use one of the methods that they don't really think makes sense. It's explicitly calculating the entire trajectory in advance. So it's like, oh, you, uh, and so this entire world of optimization, would that would be the first thing they think of doing. Um, because they're not generally thinking in terms of real-time uh, control. Uh, the issue is, what if you want to change your mind mid-movement, for instance? There are, and there are other issues with that. The, um, they, and they go through in great detail um, some of the issues with doing that. Uh, but I, I just did a quick search. And even now, optimization-based techniques are really common in, um, in robotics. And I'm pretty sure that you'll find them in neuroscience, particularly in... Uh, with, with certain, you know, the one cost fun function to rule them all in that literature. Um, so, uh, so in the, the second kind are, um, um, is what they favor. And there's is a, is a member of a, a series of types of models of this sort. Uh, 
where um, the no need arises for explicit computation and representation of the invariant trajectory. So you can have an invariant, you can display an invariant trajectory without having to compute one in advance. Um, so in models associated with us theories, a trajectory with globally invariant properties emerges in real time as a result of events distributed across many interacting sensory, neural, and muscular loci. And this is what I said about the inactivists will like this sort of thing. So that's what they're up to. Uh, they're kind of taking uh, a sort of physics-based spring-related kind of thing and saying that, well, that's not quite enough. Uh, we need to modify this with some other considerations. So yeah. the analysis uh, suggests that trajectory invariants are best understood not by focusing on velocity profile as such, but by pursuing more fundamental questions. And again, this is, I love how Steve does this, like ask the right questions, and then you kind of knock off, kind of tick off some of these things as a consequence of answering these other questions. What principles of adaptive behavioral organization constrain the system design? And what mechanisms are needed to realize these principles in a real time way? So you can say that the two types are these premeditated trajectories uh, and emergent or cybernetic trajectories. I think by this time in the 80s, the word cybernetic was, was not used anymore, but these are pretty much just cybernetic um, controllers where uh, there's a continuous real-time feedback between some sort of discrepancy signal, um, and uh, that's what's used to create uh, corrections. So Norbert Wiener's um, anti-aircraft gun, I, I, I didn't find a picture of it, but basically that's what it was doing. It was using a discrepancy and maybe some additional calibration to predict where uh, the plane would be in a little while and then use that to, uh, and that was the kind of the dawn of uh, cybernetic control, the first, first wave of cybernetics um, in World War II. So the model that I, that uh, uh, sort of we enter with, uh, which then kind of have, built on, yeah. yeah. Before you go in, you mentioned something about the fact that it can't be a simple spring-like model, right? So in yeah. fact, you, you, uh, if you talk to most people who like do anything with really, really, any really, anything relevant to motor learning or to uh, to people in sports medicine and all that stuff, uh, they never actually believe that, like let's say that you're talking about a tennis player or something, there's nothing ballistic about the motion of their forehand or any of that stuff. It is to, through and through an emergent trajectory, even the follow through is oh. an emergent trajectory. They have okay. to, the, you have to go, that's why they'll say like, you have to go like, you know, watch all the way till you follow through. It's not like simply like, just stop once you hit, make contact with the ball or whatever. It's not momentum. Yeah, in every sport. I'm just using tennis as an example, but nice. it's, so yeah, there's nothing ballistic about it. So it's sort of like a smooth, uh, yeah. you have to follow through the whole thing and correct and all that stuff. Yeah, there's, there's a whole discussion. I didn't actually pull out all of this. It's a pretty good, there's a lot of subtlety and very interesting data for why you would not want certain like hyper physics kind of based models. Uh, and changing your trajectory midway is one of the kinds of uh, reasons that you would not want something that's just to kind of spring to the to the location. And there, there was another thing about how uh, changing the speed at which you move or, or changing like when you have different differential loadings, like if your arm has a weight on it, we actually don't have that much trouble changing uh, our movements. So that's another uh, consideration, not so much for this, but for the next, uh, the direct model. Um, uh, or having a joint that's fixed. So like your arm is in a cast or something, but we'll get to that. So do, do they talk about, you know, when you're learning a skill like tennis, like a forehand or a backhand, you know, you start off with jerky movements. Mm -hmm. you know, it's not smooth. They haven't talked about that. They don't talk about sports actually much in, in the- no, they, I mean, Johan, but they do kind of even indirect, right? Like that's the babbling phase, basically. That jerky but, movement- is kind of is not that not necessarily jerky, but we'll get we'll see when we get to that part in the direct model. Of course, model. as you get older, yeah, it gets it's, jerky, right? Um, but those kinds of tremors or that yeah, might be Mark, slightly different. Then and a tremor of intention as you reach, the yeah, they might be slightly different from like a like a like if, if you imagine someone in the 80s designing a robot yeah. Yeah. Or, or like a person trying to walk like a robot in robot suit, what would they yeah, do? Uh, like, there's a lot of like Parkinson, you know? and everything else. Like instead of going like this, they go like this and like that. Yeah. I don't know whether there are tremors that look like that. Um, like what? Yeah, on like jerky. Like, like dancing, like, you know, when, when people want to dance like intense. robots, they do these like highly like Cartesian looking yeah. movements. There are. Or like, like moving, 
one only one joint first or, or moving one joint and then that joint stops moving then the other joint moves i was actually trying to do this like voluntarily and it's actually hard to to like reach for something in a way that one of the joints moves and then one stops moving and then another one keeps moving yeah <laughs> people that do like the robotic style dancing are really good at it right where they right, can like right, move right, their right. joints around and the pop and lock and all of that great. yeah yeah, yeah. Just to answer Mike's question, I, I'll take it back. Uh, the direct and fleet won't answer it. This, this will involve other models where uh, if we go through that, it will involve those models where Dan Block talks about the basal ganglia and all that stuff. Direct doesn't have any of that uh, circuit. So yeah, the, we won't, yeah, this won't be there in this model. Yeah, there's definitely, this is like a seed that you can build on uh, and you may have to re re rewire some things, but but um, yeah, there's, there's really some learning in, in the direct model. This, is not a learning model, uh, but we'll get there. Um, okay, so they call it the vector integration to endpoint to weak model. And so they're doing what, you know, anyone from an engineering or physics background would do is like, okay, let's do some uh, 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 vector robot control using neurally plausible mechanisms. Um, so, um, and they kind of say straight up that quantitative algebraic analysis is insufficient because the trajectory is an emergent property uh, of a nonlinear integration and feedback process and the variable gain control. And they do a lot with this variable gain control in, in this model. So here they're just talking about, once I have some uh, intended trajectory in joint space, uh, meaning I, I, I'm not yet worried about mapping from visual space or goal space uh, to joint space. It's like, I already have a goal in joint space, which is something other than what I am currently do, um, at. Um, so V is, a, is, is this uh, direction vector or difference vector, which is the discrepancy. It's the first thing you would try pretty much, which is you uh, look at the target position in joint space and compute the difference between that and the present position. Uh, and that they think a lot about how there's two ways that you can compute the present position. There's the sort of visual confirmation for limbs. And then there's the efference copy or coming in, there's an inflow signal coming from the limbs and then there's the outflow signal. And there can be a discrepancy between those two. So there's some calibration that needs to happen between where you think you are and where you are from visual um, confirmation. So what this DV DT is computing is the dis discrepancy or, or the error between target position and the present position and this negative V, et cetera, it's a time average. So there's a certain amount of smoothing. And that can be used as a command. You use the discrepancy as a command and that's pure cybernetics. It's like you, and because, so the command in this case is this P, um, the um, position command, which is just proportional to the difference. So meaning that once you have minimized the difference, the command goes away. And this multiplicative gain allows you to independently change the speed at which you do uh, you do this. And also it's a, a, a sort of one dimensional signal. So you can simultaneously use this gain for all your effectors. Um, and so, so that even if you speed up, all your articulators will move um, at roughly the same, uh, for roughly the same duration. Can you explain that? In, uh, there's a sec pl place where they explain that. So, um, so, it, so this is the discrepancy, and um, they're very careful to show that uh, 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 since neurons uh, can't have negative values, or you know, the, the the spiking only is only positive, the the effect can only be when this discrepancy is positive. And here's where you'll need to use um, opponent processing. Um, so yes, so the go signal comes in to modulate that. Um, difference, but multiplicatively. And here's, I, I was actually thinking this type of effect, a multiplicative effect is so useful that you kind of wonder in a more neurally detailed model, are, are we guaranteed that we can get this type of multiplicative effect? There are a few ways of doing it with spiking models. Um, I saw actually one, a paper that was pretty cool, Ken Miller, but they all involve, you know, some very specific assumptions, but uh, it's something to keep in mind. And if any of you come across good neural evidence for like multiplicative signals at, at fairly sort of coarse grain, um, uh, keep sending them to me <laughs> because it's a good thing to keep track of. Um, so how does synchronous synergy work? It's just using these very simple equations basically. So, um, so we apply the circuit properties that each muscle synergist is updated at a rate, that's this equation three, updated at a rate that's proportional to both 
to the synergist distance, so that discrepancy, that's the rectified V, and to a variable magnitude go sigma. And from there, <laughs> it's, it's fairly straightforward how this gives you that, that synergy. Um, because you have proportion uh, the the discrepancy controlling um, th this. So if you have muscle synergist A is four distance units from its target and muscle synergy synergist B is two distance units, then uh, if the mean rates are updated for the two synergists in the same proportion as the distance, then the updating, basically things will cancel out <laughs> and, and the travel time will be the same. So it's a surprisingly simple, straightforward uh, way to get um, synchronous movement. So although the, the present position command updating process occurs at different rates for different synergies, it consumes equal times for all the synergies, which is uh, an actual experimental finding. Uh, and uh, the, the opponent processing has been a theme. We talked about gated dipoles, and there's a version of that kind of thing happening here. Um, it was already known that uh, mammalian motor systems are organized in pairs of agonist antagonist. But here they kind of show a sort of functional way of approaching this idea. Um, you have these dis 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 discrepancy vector. And in most coordinate systems, there will be some coordinates, like even in a spherical or cylindrical coordinate system, some of the coordinates will have to go take both positive and negative values. So it's, what do I do with those negative values, G given that positive um, firing is all I have access to really. Um, so an opponent organization is needed to convert those DVs, those discrepancy di difference vectors into commands that can eventually match an arbitrary target position uh, command. Um, so, that, so the need for opponent signaling can be seen from the following examples. If a target position signal is larger than the corresponding present position signal and a positive output signal is generated, um, on the, and then if you want to go on the other side, you can't use that signal because of that particular effector, you have to go on the other side. So you have to use the antagonist um, and that will inhibit this. And it's more or less what these muscles do. And so the corresponding component of the DV is when it's negative, you need to use a different command because only non-negative activities generate output signals. So it's, it's a really, really simple reason for having this kind of uh, opponent processing. Uh, of course, when you look at that circuit, it seems really complicated, but it's, it's almost forced upon you by what you know uh, from, from muscle um, opponency. But it's a nice purely functional way of understanding that, that once you have this particular constraint of positive definite neural uh, firing, then you start to see things like this for control purposes, for anything that requires uh, a two-sided uh, difference computation, basically you hardly ever see this come up. And in fact, it really bothers me when people use just pure uh, you know, deep learning style uh, weights because those weights can be both positive and negative and they're treated symmetrically. And they always kind of hand wave and say, well, you can rescale things in such a way that inhibition does the job of the negative weight. But I never seen anything that like clearly demonstrates that that's the case or that you can get that to work especially given time, the you know, time discrepancies and things like that. So Han, where does, um, where does this model kind of uh, interact with the sort of cells that you find in the spinal cord? Because um, I remember reading one of Friston's works thinking about um, muscle movements and he, for him, the, the, the key issue is that you only move if there's a prediction error. And so you want something that will squash a prediction error so that you can move and so he wanted desperately the projections to hit into neurons that were inhibitory rather than right. say gamma motor neurons or alpha motor neurons. I was just really curious where um, kind of Steve would and Dan would put that link or, and if you're not there yet, don't this stress. Is a, I just, I'm just... So this T minus P is a prediction error uh, because T, if you want in the Fristonian world is a prediction. They call it a command here, but it's a predict, you can call it a prediction too. Um, so this is just an average prediction error. And then if, if the command works as it should, uh, then the prediction error will go to zero. So if you're to implement this particular subtraction, implicitly Steve is using into, into neural uh, to, uh, here. Um, so you need it. You, you'll definitely need to, to kind of futz around to get these things to work out right. Um, you know, if you're using 
real, more realistic excited neurons and inhibitory neurons. But I, I don't know how that fits it because this, the, the data that they review for the plausibility of these, these cell responses are mainly cortical. Um, they don't look so much at spinal cord because they're thinking of like motor cortex to spinal cord and then that kind of does the, uh, there there's a bit of dot, dot, dot and so on uh, as far as I know. But, uh, but yeah, the um, invertebrates, uh, there's only excitatory control of the actual muscle fibers. So all that inhibitory control has to happen early. Yeah. So Johan, I just wanted to say, I mean, isn't the one of the whole proposed roles of NMDA receptors to allow multiplicative um, single neuron? Yeah, yeah. I, I've seen this. I'm not happy with the, like the simulations are a bit fiddly. Uh, like I, I've looked into it and the NMDA, I've seen a, that that Ken Miller paper, Miller paper actually talks about you know, tonic AMPA and, and uh, uh, GABA even doing this with under certain assumptions about how the stimulus transforms into an input. So they have an additional sigmoid somewhere in there, which is interesting. But but yeah, there's, yeah, I'm, I've not seen anything very, very clean that in the sense that I could take a Grossbergian model and then just immediately start turning it into an Izikovich model. I haven't seen anything that would make it that easy. So far, have, you looked, look, have you looked at the schizophrenia literature? Because I have now that I'm reading it, have discovered that there's a whole ton of stuff about NMDA receptors and malfunction in schizophrenia that looks a lot like a lack of multiplication. Yeah, so that's how I modeled it. <laughs> uh, or, or, meaning I, I actually, in, in, in one of our, my papers, which actually does the same thing, it's a motor error map um, for controlling eye movements. Uh, I, I um, disrupted the NMDA receptors, but specifically on the interneuron. And for that, I, did, I didn't need the uh, multiplicative effect, but because um, I was mainly just sort of looking at how the weaker inhibition would work. But but yeah, I need to look at some of this multiplicative stuff too. So yes, we talked about opponent processing. Getting it to work with interneurons is going to be, there's lots of implementation challenges and making sure that it's justified by the data. Uh, and this is how basically that would work, pairs of antag uh, agonists and antagonists, and you'd get some zero crossing where you flip from one to the other, from antagonist being excited to agonist being excited. Uh, there's another interesting uh, phenomenon that they, they observe. So uh, you can, uh, especially with monkeys, you can do this where you, you give them a, a, a cue and then say, go reach for that. And then there's this interrupt, no, 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 go to this other cue um, somewhere uh, 100 to 300 milliseconds after that initial cue. And they smoothly go to the other, to, to the new target. And what's interesting is that, that, that um, uh, at least in this paper, George, Georgeopoulos, uh, uh, they, they quote Georgeopoulos saying, very few people seem to care about the fact that there's a speed up when you go to a new uh, target. Uh, not that many people have modeled uh, at that time anyway. But they have, again, a very, very simple way of modeling it using this uh, multiplicative um, go signal, um, which is that the go signal, because it's low dimensional and going to all these effectors, when you've already initiated a movement, there's already a non-zero go uh, G here, oops, um, a non-zero go, um, that kind of just gets carried over to this uh, new target so that you get a much larger multiplication than when you're initiating a movement from, from zero. The idea being that G itself has a dynamic quality and when you're initiating a movement from stationary, that's zero too. So that goes up and in fact, they use a sigmoid to model that. But if it's already up because you're already moving, then you're going to get a multiplier effect um, for any subsequent target. And they, so that's how they model that. So in this case, in the second simulation, the, the go um, signal is already non-zero. So you still get that same profile because it's multiplicative, but it speeds up. Uh, again, very neat little <laughs> uh, way of doing this. If I, if I remember correctly, the, the much more fleshed out neural model was what uh, Paul Sizek did with Steve. Ah, okay, um, I haven't looked at that. Anymore. Yeah, I think the, the, the Kalaska did much more detailed work after he started his own group. And Paul Cezek actually like recapitulated a lot of that work. 
uh, right, right, right. This is like the first effort, right? Like in, in yeah. many ways, it's sort of like just setting like the broad, very coarse model for everything. Uh, yeah. And then you'll see like, yeah, I think Paul Sezek did those multiple constraints and this was one of the constraints that he definitely modeled at the neural level, much more detailed instead of like just simply saying V, T and P and all that, so. Right. A lot more moving parts to, <laughs> to get to work. So that was the, the VEAT model, which is basically looking at uh, saying, well, if we already have uh, a, uh, targets that are in the coordinates of movement, uh, in using that controller metaphor, it's like, well, like you already know what you're supposed to do with your thumbs in the controller, then you can, there are already invariants that you can model just by using that, that um, framework about the discrepancy signals and, and, and a gain, gain term, basically. But uh, there's this wider spatiotemporal problem, uh, which apparently is known as the Bernstein problem, or has been called that. Uh, so this, um, so Nikolai Bernstein wrote that it is clear that the basic difficulties for coordination consist precisely in the extreme abundance of degrees of freedom with which the nervous cent um, uh, center is not at first in a position to deal. So you're spoiled for choice in terms of ways to achieve something. And I immediately thought of the brain as a Rube Goldberg machine. It's like I can go this way, I can go around, I can, you know, there's many, many different ways I can do things. Um, so even in the VEAT, so in the VEAT model, what's cool is you can see that they're building up to the direct model. It's, uh, you know, I don't know, for all, for all I know, Dan had, uh, Frank Gunther had already joined the department by this point, maybe. But um, uh, you can tell that, that, that this was a progressive research project because they were already laying out the pieces of things that they had not yet modeled and saying, well, this needs to be modeled. Um, so one of the major outstanding problems in our movement control is to relate the geometry of the high dimensional muscle space with the geometry of Euclidean space. So when I said earlier about that, you have a visual map and I have this controller, they are not speaking the same language They're in completely different coordinates. So uh, you can't like introspect and find out what it is you're doing about that because it's like, Difficult for mathematicians to do it too. And it's also uh, under constrained. When you have a very high dimensional system that's trying to map onto a lower dimensional system, there are infinitely many ways that you, you can go from one to the other. So, so the direct model is a self-organized neural model of motor uh, equivalent reaching. And what is motor equivalence? So it's precisely uh, uh, this idea that there are, um, many degrees of freedom and the arm can use them uh, to carry out spatially defined tasks under conditions that may require novel joint config, uh, configuration. So I've used this example before, probably even in this, where if I asked you to write down the letter Q with your elbow, you may never have done it, but you have some sort of representation of Q memory of what Q looks like in your, in your brain that you can use to use an articulator and create joint configurations that you may never have used before. Um, so, so yes, that's what this model is going to, uh, maybe tell us how it might work. Uh, another name for this issue is, is the inverse kinematics problem. I don't know whether Bernstein called it that, but that's a common term for this. Um, so to, to exhibit motor equivalence while reaching a spatial target, the effector system, the articulators, uh, need to possess, uh, excess or redundant degrees of freedom. Um, so that's where this ill-posed kind of issue is. It's like having, uh, you know, a system of equations, uh, too few equations in, uh, compared to the number of uh, variables. Um, so any linear combination of solution. So this is cool. It's a nice little mathematical trick again they're using, which you should maybe just look at the paper to, to work through it. But um, any linear combination of solutions from spatial directions to joint angles uh, changes. Uh, generates a trajectory that is continuous in joint space. So there's this nice little trick just from linear algebra that, that um, uh, kind of points them in the direction that instead of explicitly computing targets in joint space, I can uh, map to changes in joint space because any combination of changes uh, is continuous in joint space. So it's, rather than like telling you, I want your joints to be over there, but it's like, but how do I get there? Uh, instead, I'm giving you commands of like, move this this way, move this this way, that sort of thing. So changes are always continuous in the, uh, from the perspective of where you are currently, regardless of where you are currently. 
So here's the, the, the flow of, of the model. You have a visual computation of the end effector, the hand or the finger. Uh, and that could be anything actually, interestingly enough. In this model, they show that you, that's not fixed to some specific end effector. Um, then you have, uh, well, I'll go this way first. You have some sort of target position in visual coordinates. Um, and you need to compute, and, and let's say that your target that you want to be at. So you have the current position and you have where you want to get to, for so let's say the position of your finger, uh, you compute a diff difference vector, uh, just like in the VEAT model. Uh, but then that difference vector is in spatial coordinates. It's, it's uh, like if it were Cartesian coordinates, it would be the X0, Y0 of where you are currently, where your tip of your finger is currently, and the X1, Y1 of where you'd like to be. But what do, what do you do with them? Like what, like this delta x and delta y, of what relevance are they to the, the the effector system, which is, let's say, a bunch of angles for different joints. So that's where uh, there's this spatial to motor direction to rotation transformation that involves a couple of steps, some of which are learned, uh, and then you integrate the joint angle increments to create the final position, and then that's fed back. And the reason that this feedback exists is specifically because once you've learned how to use your limbs, like after you're a small child, and um, you can often uh, just reach without visual feedback in the dark, for instance. Uh, so they were very careful to make sure that that was possible uh, and show how, how that kind of representation can be learned. Um, so that you can, once that has been set up, have multimodal visual motor targets, meaning that they, they don't, they, they're like in visual space and in motor space that you can create um, a target. So, so what is this direction to rotation transformation? That's like the real heart of this um, and, and the heart of any uh, uh, targeting system that all of these system, uh, models, regardless of how they do it, are going to have to do this in some way or the other. Um, so it's basically this whole thing where you have directions in some space, which is not the space in which you perform the actions. So um, this is just showing that, that the VEAT, the basic VEAT model is kind of sitting inside here. Where, so it's like, we already know once I have uh, target commands in joint uh, units, what to do with them. So the question is, how do I get to that, that in the first place? And that's where this direction to rotation transform comes in. To, to basically do a coordinate transformation. Um, right there, yeah. So uh, they spend a little time in the paper, in the direct model paper, um, talking about the difference between um, map style representations and vector style representations. And I think this is a really good topic. Again, it's sort of trivial in a way in that most neuroscientists implicitly assume one or the other when they're looking at data, if they think about what the neuron means to the rest of the system at all. Um, so, but uh, it's, it's good to kind of be explicit about which it is you think it, it is, because they need, need not be obvious uh, just from the nature of the problem. And you, you may not need to look at the data, and in some cases it's not. So if you have a position, um, you could represent it using a kind of isomorphic map where the, the neural map corresponds to the to the to, to place. Uh, it's a little bit like how, um, like for instance, in 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 with the the auditory um, uh, cortex, the way that frequencies are represented shifts from one type of representation to another. So because so we, we can hear sounds from twenty hertz to twenty thousand hertz, but neurons can't fire at twenty thousand hertz. Neurons can fire at twenty hertz or hundred hertz. So there are cells that actually just track the actual frequency of low frequency sounds. But then they shift to become a place code. A place code is one where the neurons firing rate tells you nothing about the frequency of, of the sound, but where it is in, in, in relation to other neurons uh, is, the, is the code. So you can have even in the same um, brain area as a mixed coding. In this case, going, in, in the case of auditory cortex, going from a, a time, time code to a place code. So a little bit like just moving from a temp, the time domain to a Fourier domain, basically. Um, so in this case- So, so with that, Johan, I mean, are there, 
are there like physical cells or like the hairs on cells that can respond to those higher frequencies like right like there must be something in the system that can respond to it but the cells yeah. the neurons themselves can't yeah. so all they can do is just map for the fact that that thing that they were monitoring was currently being perturbed or something right. is that so it's indirect so the, the basal membrane it, it it's you know in the cochlea it's all wound up but if you sort of stretch mm. it out yeah uh, low frequencies are further in right is that how it works or yeah that's right because they get attenuated so, yeah yeah so the high frequency ones so so the so the physical transduction of the membrane responds to all those frequencies and yeah. the, the place is is like where the maximal response of the basilar membrane is will push those hair cells and those will mm -hmm. um, trigger firing like little yeah. trip wires but yeah. is, it, it, it seems to me like a really interesting test case for the whole kind of like how neurons represent perception that there's actually no neurons that could actually represent that one uh tone directly because they can't handle that spiking that far so all that they've got it's like the kind of plato's cave right all they've got is the shadow on the wall telling them that there was something that was perturbing it but yet mm -hmm. it shows up to us as a sound yes. that's quite remarkable when you yes. think about it yeah, anyway, yeah sorry i, I just thought i'd navel gaze for a second that. yeah 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 <laughs> so yeah that, that was exactly the kind of topic that you know people should think about when they're looking at data in, in, you know before just throwing it into the statistical blender is, is to ask these functional questions about like well what could a response like this be if you're talking about you know generally people will i mean it's safe to assume that for complicated representations like objects and things it's some sort of position map or a distributed position map meaning that it's almost like a barcode or something like this 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 and this have to fire and it must be a dog or something like that um, well, I mean, is is I mean, I'm you know thinking back to the barn owls, which you know do have cells that seem to have multiplicative responses, you know, and that special thing that they have. But I mean, isn't this all you know inferometry basically? Inferometry is, is like in what is inferometry? Like I'm confusing it with interferometry. Sorry, it, uh, I was speaking quickly. Interferometry. But 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 in what context? Uh, like you mean like signal signal processing? Yeah, that you're looking at collisions yeah. and misses. Right. So there's ways. I mean, if you're looking for carefully for it, um, uh, you'll probably find evidence for a bit of both. But in fact, the position, um, the uh, the vector representation, where the actual firing uh is carrying some information is quite neglected in neuroscience if anything everybody seems to just naturally assume position maps and the issue with position maps is in some places you you need to like do a, some work to figure out how analog sensitivity uh can also happen for instance sensitivity to brightness or loudness or or even in abstract dimensions like some sort of flavor or uh, if you say like in some higher dimension of like, oh, this is really, really a 1950s song, you know? So there's a sense in which we, we, we have, uh, we can project even complex categories onto a kind of one dimensional intensity space or whatever you want to call it. Uh, How do we do that? <laughs> I, I've, I'm, I've always been interested in this type of sensitivity, but I don't know how it's, how the brain does it. Have have you seen uh, Naya Marshall's um, preprint with Mark Churchland on microstimulation of individual neurons in M1 and what that does to individual muscle fibers? Send it to me. It sounds cool. Um, so, Mac, the, your question about the whole like you know the fact that no neuron can individually like <laughs> be capable of twenty thousand hertz or something like that. There is an exception though, right? Like that's the whole olfactory system. Uh, for us, the glomeruli, uh, which are there right near the where your uh, olfactory sensors are, are kind of directly getting the inputs from sort of the, the immediate receptors. That's why like, this is a controversial opinion, but most people think that's why like, it's one of those uh, exclusive uh, sensory modalities, which has its own stem cell niche because it has to be recycled all the time that it's, you know, it's uh, unlike your ear or something where like it's only the higher cells which are going to be damaged eventually and not your neurons. Uh, 
On the other hand, in the olfactory system, it's the cell itself that is under direct attack from the chemical uh, chemicals impinging on it that you know the the damage is there and all that stuff. So that has to be constantly replenished. So there is an exception, uh, but you're right with respect to like everything else, there is a, a transduction element that has to happen. Otherwise you won't be able to capture this dynamic range that most of us are working in. Mm. Yeah, I don't know enough about the olfactory system. It's fascinating though. Emoception gets it. up close and personal. <laughs> yeah, like it's like the one sensory modality that doesn't involve the thalamus. And so like people were using it to rule out these kind of thalamocortical stories that used to pervade the literature from like, um, uh, who am I thinking of? The thalamo, uh, the vortex. Um, R Rodolfo Linas had a, mm -hmm. had a story about whatever entered into the thalamocortical vortex was the thing you were conscious of. It's like, well, yeah, but smells don't. <laughs> so what's going on with that? <laughs> Mac, is that true even for uh, for mice? Is oh, I look, I, I'm not, a, I'm absolutely out of my element with smell. Um, Ask my wife, uh, she'll olfaction, tell you. Um, olfaction does have a pathway to the thalamus from, right. the, from, the, from the olfactory cortex. Okay. But, it doesn't, but go what, to the, it, it doesn't go to the thalamus, then to the cortex. It goes to the um, olfactory cortex. It has one pathway that goes to the thalamus, one that comes up to the orbital frontal cortex. So it goes to it. Yeah, it's really. Where, where does it use? Where does it go in the thalamus? Is it like anterior nucleus or? I can't, I don't know off the top of my head. Yeah. So I, um, yeah, I thought the story was something like it did, at the very least it did something extremely different than the other primary modalities like vision and audition and, and um, somatic sensation, right? Which went, uh, you know, via an intermediary, like the dorsal column tract goes to the gracile and cuneate, and then that goes into, you know, the, whatever it is, the posterior, lateral posterior nucleus or whatever, and then up to S1. Um, but it, it didn't do something like that. So maybe there is some kind of it's, projection it, that then ultimately makes it there, but not, it doesn't go there first or something. Right, or maybe that's right. the specific go ahead. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. I don't know if you've read um, how the brain creates the flavor of wine. What's it called? I, um, I'll have to look it up. I, I, in my brain and behavior class, when I talk about perception, I use that book and I bring in a glass of water put some red dye in there and I go through a wine tasting and I can talk about every sensory system as I do that and bring it all together for everybody. Cool. And they love it. And I get 19 year olds coming up. Oh, I want to drink wine now. I said, no, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta wait till you're 21 to tell me that. Yeah. But it's a lot of fun. Let me find the book. So yeah, in cool. this in, in the paper, they talk about how ev there's evidence for both these types of maps, and they're going to use both of them. The in superior colliculus, there's a difference map uh, code that uh, each map location tends to code a different combination of movement lengths and directions. And when I read this, I was thinking, okay, but saccades are unique in that they have this; they are ballistic, and they also don't have this constraint of different differential weighting. In fact, they themselves in this paper talk about how. The overall motor system is distinct from the eye, eye movements because there aren't little things that occasionally weigh down our eyes. Uh, so there are different constraints, and you and saccades are, are like you know these little ballistic movements. They kind of get sent uh, with this single kind of percussive almost command going go do do the saccade, whereas this motor control is not like that. Like for the rest of the voluntary movement, uh, but that's yeah bookmark the so yeah so that's an eccentricity map. So the further you are out, the larger the distance of the correction you need to make and the larger the movement is. So the place tells you everything about what firing in that particular cell will do. Um, and in the monkey motor cortex, there's a vector code wherein each cell tends to generate a broad unimodal tuning curve of direction preference that may include 180 degrees of movement direction. There's a whole lot of data you know, on this sort of thing. Um, and movement amplitude tends to co-vary. Co co with the firing rates of those cells. Um, so getting back to that sort of the core tricky part uh, of the model, it's this uh, position direction map uh, is, is a map of cells, each of which is maximally sensitive to a particular spatial direction uh, in a particular position of joint space. So it took me a while, I sat for a while thinking, what does this mean exactly? And, um, but, um, basically, it's a lookup table, um, and it isn't learned in this model, 
but Steve has done a lot of work and other people have for, for self-organizing maps, where basically you explore uh, uh, and you can kind of evenly distribute a group of cells so that they respond differentially to different parts of this state space. In this case, it's a very, it's a large state space. So they had to, they modeled some 10,000 neurons uh, to cover all these possibilities. So they had three um, effector angles and the, they were doing 2D spatial uh, commands. So, so there's the, so there's a, and different angles um, for each. So it's quite a, quite a lot, but you know, with large amount of neural uh, infrastructure, you assume, well, it's probably doing something like this uh, to make these tasks of maps and maps between maps easier. So this is hardwired in the model, but there are other things that are learned. Um, and the learning takes place during endogenous random movement, babbling, or the motor equivalent of babbling. So if you look here, the motor direction vector, which works like in the VEAT where it's command to move the articulator, has two inputs. One is coming from basically the command, the discrepancy in space, but there's this endogenous random generator. And so you're just kind of waving your arms around uh, like a baby. Uh, and this is quite important for completing this whole uh, transformation. Um, so, so you see that- is there, a, is there a way, Johan, to maybe finesse that randomness a little bit more rather than having to be a unique box. It's kind of like, just like a stochastic ticker that kind of just throws randomness in, rather have connections between certain neural structures be diffuse and hence like oh. unlikely to have exactly the same effect every single time they're active. I yeah. think you have this I think you can do that. Yeah, that'll be better. In fact, you can do that or you can even add stochasticity in the motor yeah, direction. Into like the yeah, you yeah like add... the whole empty synapse thing where like the neurotransmitters sometimes just don't get released from the vesicles. And so even though the neuron fired an action potential, nothing happens sometimes at a certain proportion. So you almost like have randomness built into the biological machinery right. anyway. Yeah. So the trick is not so much randomness as getting randomness on the scale you want. So yeah. double clicking on this box is actually a lot of fun. And I have done a little of this uh, with a basal ganglia circuit, actually. Yeah, um, I was going to say the basal ganglia is where you'd look. Uh, but this is and... this is where the confusion comes in, right? Because the traditional models are all about these parallel inscribed loops where the thalamus goes you know, right back to the same cortical area that recruited the basal ganglia in the first place. This Alexander DeLong and Strick kind of model. Whereas if you look at the topography of the cells that the basal ganglia is connecting to and, and disinhibiting, they're really the matrix-like cells that some of them have targeted connections, sure, but a lot of them don't. And so you, you automatically get this kind of variability baked into that level of the circuit just by recruiting the basal ganglia to you know, gate the thalamus. All of a sudden it's like, okay, now the thing, this, the cortical population that activated the basal ganglia the first time, it can get recruited, but so can a bunch of ones that are a little bit like it. And so now all of a sudden you get that kind of, um, that variability that's related to the original pattern. So I know we've talked about this before, but I just think that's an important thing to bring up that it, it need not be this kind of magical randomness box, but rather something that the system just is sort of set up to do. You, but you need the randomness box even for a model. So, 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 so for instance, the thing that the model will eventually do is control the, the scale of your random impulses. So for instance, if I want to randomly explore something, uh, using the time scale of vesicle release is not going to do the job. <laughs> uh, it, I need something that lasts for like tens, hundreds of milliseconds if I want to jump around in a coherent way among in, in a, So there's a difference between having random fluctuations and spikes and randomly exploring a set of attractors. So doing that is a, is a task, right? So you can model it's not that difficult. But the trick is the resetting part. So you can uh, make a bunch of attractors all equally likely and then have even input. So when the input is even, then the only thing that breaks symmetry is the noise. And then it'll fall into an attractor. So falling in an attractor becomes equivalent to amplification, meaning that um, I can't just use the noise. I need to use the noise as a, as a casting vote for a competitive network. But then once I've done that, because now the neurons are self-reinforcing, I need to get out of that in order to do the choice again. 
So there's a fair amount of deterministic machinery in order to, like I like to think of it as amplification of noise um, uh, to map to the scale at which you need it. So there's a lot of modeling need <laughs> that has to be done there. So, so can you give an model. example, uh, a specific motor and randomness and why, like, what is this, what yes. are the attractors you're, you're trying to talk about in, in like a specific thing. motion, like trying to touch someone's finger and cut your nose will be the randomness and the exploration. Uh, your audio broke up a little bit towards the end, but I think I know. So let's say that I have, I'm sitting in front of a piano. Okay, and I've got my fingers on, you know, C to G, and I want to randomly play, play keys, and maybe I'm trying to figure out a melody. Um, how would I do this? Like, let's say that there are five groups of neurons that represent five commands, wherever they happen to be, motor cortex most likely, but basically are possible too. Um, so uh, what do I need to do? Uh, I need, a, I, I can't just have random spikes, right? Uh, I, because the spikes may not be of sufficient duration to get the actual command to take place. Uh, at the same time, I don't want a plan because a plan would involve, you know, just you know, doing that or doing arpeggios all the time. So what I need is to make all of them eligible for firing. So somehow have the activity going up and being roughly equal. So in, in any competitive network, if you have uh, no breaking of symmetry. So if all the, the, the neurons are the same type and they all have the same input, they won't be co competition. They'll just all cancel each other. But then as soon as you introduce, in, in the case of a Grossberg, like a shunting network, any arbitrarily small symmetry breaking will cause a winner. And the winner will then have the full excitation value that it, it is capable of because of the uh, positive feedback. So that's entering deep into an attractor. So if you think of this in terms of attractors, the, the depth of the attractor is how, how much activity you can get from that particular ensemble. But what you want is to make uh, all of them have appreciable attractors uh, and have the input such that you're, you, and then you need to reset and get back onto the ridge between each of them. So the reset becomes what you really need to model because there's some time scale involved in that. And, and it's not just a time scale issue. It can be um, like uh, you may want to um, uh, be exploratory on some higher level, like uh, not just a piano, but like exploratory of like if you're in some you know, theater coach and you want to randomly ask your actors to pick out different emotions or 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 even completely different activities that, that you know do something highly specific and then jump to something quite different so there's a, so how do you do this like so you, you in some nobody knows how, how this is done but like if i were to model this i i would be like well there are um more and less specific ways of specifying what your behavioral state is and if you want to make that accessible to, uh, but also some other adjacent state accessible. Uh, that's like creating sets of attractors and then somehow placing the system on the ridge. So it's something that is relatively easy for humans, <laughs> which is amazing. Um, but, uh, but not, but I think there's variability even among humans. Like for instance, have you ever played these games where you, uh, somebody has to say a random word and they just blank? Like some people just don't say anything. Um, I've always wondered why they, they had such difficulty, but it's almost, and, and sometimes when people are asked to do this, they will say something that makes a little too much sense. Like, <laughs> uh, and and uh, so there are individual differences in your ability to like sort of sample. Uh, to, and it's not about the sampling so much as create, setting up the bins. So yeah. for me, <laughs> this is like one of my favorite topics I'm going on about it, <laughs> but this endogenous random generator is a whole model. But my point is that, in order to get something that looks like picking, you'll still need noise. So uh, I would just like to make two, two points related to this. Um, one is that um, both people like Helen, uh, Barbas and um, Eric uh, made a point of think, think of that the number of noisy spikes in the sense of heat noise or you know thermodynamic noise in the brain is almost certainly 
zilch, almost zilch. I mean, it's like 1% maybe at most. Um, so in terms of like noise at the level of vesicle release, there's a lot of evidence that the brain, that evolution has gone, has tracked the brain into a space where very, very little of that happens. The second one. <laughs> so, so it's like this, it's like amplifying whatever source of randomness you happen to have can be quite a useful thing. Um, like, like in, in fact, there's all these like decision theory related, um, like almost, I think they're theorems, right? Like that in certain situations, sortition is the thing you should do. Um, so being able to do that is, uh, and I'm sure even gamblers, right? They, they need to be able to be unpredictable and to be unpredictable, uh, in fact, not just gamblers, no. various people, it's useful to be somewhat unpredictable. And that involves in some sense sampling. So if it's not the case that we're using vesicle release or random, um, like just ambient thermal noise, then we have to have pseudo random number generators or I, hope, <laughs> I don't know how it would work otherwise. Okay, you, 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 I'm, no, thinking you about tra I'm thinking about trail running as you do this because the, the ground you're going over is very random. You know, it's, it's uneven, there's rocks, there's roots. There's leaves you might slip over, and so you're, it, it, you know, it's not a consistent step. You're constantly having to adjust to everything, and some people are really fast at that, especially going downhill, and they can just fly. I go much slower downhill. Yeah, being Same. old, but it is that. Yeah, fact, that that is very much the way I, I think about it. Both. Yeah external and internal sources of noise it's, it's exactly. almost and i don't want to make too big a deal out of this i don't know how often right. we need it that we're sort of keeping our eyes out for so it's, it's almost like a, a resource yeah. that you need to kind of like, like for instance when people want true randomness right what do they use cosmic radiation so 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 it's something that like you kind of uh, collect um for, uh, and the brain so, maybe doing so, so, well, this gets to the second point that I was making, which is we do have a great source of really well uh, scaled noise in the brain. And that has to do with the fact that when we have organized circuits for, say, I'm going to think of motion detection or, or orientation detection here as the sort of canonical example. The uh, cells that provide the best signal in that case are not the cells that have the peak response, but the cells that have the highest first derivative at the area of the response. So the sharper the slope that a cell has in its response curve, the more information it gives you yeah. at any given time. Up near the peak of the response, the cell is going to be fairly flat to very small details in um, uh, to, to differences in orientation or motion. And, you know, this, this was work that was first sort of really done by um, uh, Steve, uh, Osborne and Lisberger, I think, and then uh, Rust and, um, um, uh, why am I blanking on his name, at NYU Mahshan. Um, and they showed very convincingly that the edge, the, the first derivative is the mm -hmm. really important stuff, but also that the responses near the peak are really noisy because, you know, even slight differences in the eye position or, you know, just the, you know, the retinal uh, oscillation all create noise from the point of view of actually deciding which, say, direction the stimulus is moving in, whether it's moving in this direction or this direction. Mm -hmm. So actually, there's a huge amount of non-thermal noise noise being introduced by tuning curves in the brain, because what you really are trying to do is recruit the, the cells that have their tuning curve here, you know, that you're at the middle here, not that you're at the top here. So, so this endogenous noise generator system actually, you know, whether there's a specific system for it or not, there's a lot of noise availability at the peak of the tuning curves mm -hmm. that provide almost no information, but provide uh, or very little information, but are a great source of noise. Right, right. And I guess thinking more about this pseudo-random idea, the, um, if, if it's the case that, well, 
well, no, that's you know, presupposes you can pick randomly. For, like if you were to like, if you're doing something in the auditory domain and you just happen to allow some piece of information from the visual uh, system to influence what you're doing, that still involves selection. So it's, it's a bit tricky. But anyway, uh, that's a whole fun topic actually. Um, but yes, okay. So this uh, control of the articulator is, there's two inputs. There's the, uh, well, well, we'll talk about this in a sec, but basically that's the position direct direction map here. That's the command. But then there's this X, which is the random part. So you can just move around like a baby does. By, by the way, I, sh I should just remind people that they are doing this, uh, making this into this sort of a equation and not into a differential equation for a very specific reason. Because anytime you want to like create this sort of like a mapping with self-organization, it's almost insane to create this model. Like I've, I literally spent close to seven months trying to get a game field to be self-organized, learn via self-organizing maps. It didn't work. We gave up. So it's sort of like, it's an almost, it's like in principle, it works. But like when you start implementing it, it's like, it's a, it's, it's a cruel joke. I spent so, seven months of my PhD just trying on that one part, just one, that one step. Basically that the part that I highlighted, right? Yeah, so, that, that mapping part is super hard. So you weren't able to get uh, sufficient time scale separation? For me, it was spatial. Even It's a different one. It's a game field uh, map uh, okay. that I wanted in the predictively mapping sense. It's, it's not very huh. different here. It's... Huh. I, I would just point out also in sort of my my model, the surfaces were solved at equilibrium. It was an algebraic right, yeah, yeah, you that. model, and that was a time scale issue. Um, and also, I just want to say in, in Frank, I think to this day is still pissed off that his last name starts. <laughs> <laughs> um, and this is very much his paper. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, okay, so we looked at this. Um, so that's, so yeah, so what is, so the whole point of the babbling, they got this idea from Piaget, Piaget um, and who in, in turn actually got some of this from, I forget his name, but there, there was someone from the late 1800s who was also talking about these circular reactions, which is that you, you do something and then you kind of like, look at what you did and then you can redo that and look at the consequences of what you did. So the exploration, there's an attentional component to this because you need to kind of pay attention to what you did. Um, so, so this is one of the things that needs to be learned, which is you have this um, map from spatial commands, which is go here, go there, to spatial positions and it's the positions that then get converted into, in, in that lookup table kind of thing, that get converted into joint space commands. And so that is learned using an outstar. So we already talked about how outstars work. So it's a very straightforward modification of Hebbian learning. And so uh, if you calibrate things just right, basically um, you're learning the, like what, uh, what put me in that position, basically. It's like, I have this um, uh, command position map and, and that's correctly kind of telling me uh, where my joints are and what, uh, what, the, what the sort of difference vector is. We'll get to, there's a subtlety there. Uh, and then sort of mapping that onto the, these random commands that, that are, uh, so basically, learning kind of the precedents that produce commands. So it's, not, it's, it's mapping from effects to causes, basically, um, which is very useful. So the general scheme or the, the strategy here is to learn two things. How, um, the uh, causes that cause effects. So you randomly create a bunch of effects and then you map the causes that can produce those effects. And then you learn a good representation of the spatial consequences of the effects. So then you can take the spatial consequences and then make that your goal. It's basically what these two types of learning are doing. So the second one is, is to, to take the present position and turn it into, which is incomplete joint coordinates and convert it back into spatial coordinates. So that's for the uh, dead rec like reckoning in the dark um, so that uh, after moving around, and cal basically you're calibrating what you see with what you're experiencing in the body uh, so that when your eyes are closed, you can continue to learn, uh, you can continue to use your, your limbs. And this part of the, the map is going back from motor to spatial. 
Um, and so in the so here these E's are basically the the commands uh, in spatial coordinates. Um, I think they use spherical coordinates here, but you can also produce uh, commands using this position place map. So without any visual signal. So there are two ways that you can get a spatial difference map, which then through that that uh, self-organized map uh, finds the commands that. Uh, so basically, it's like this: you're, the the way in which you're specifying where you want to go is in coordinates that aren't joint coordinates, uh, and that you know aligns with with introspection to some extent. Like I know what I want to do at in a in a set of coordinates that has nothing to do with joint coordinates. So these two maps basically uh, enable the system to to learn which motor commands will produce the goals in visual space. But then it will also learn that how to produce um, the same effects without any visual feedback. And so you can call that hand-eye coordination. That's what this model is learning. Uh, there's two sets of, of weights that it's learning. The eye slash body position to body movement map and the body position to eye position map. Those are the two sets of weights that are being learned. Um, and it, this is the only bit of the book that I actually pulled out, but because uh, I, I feel like he only spends a few pages on this, but there's a lot here. It took me a while to feel comfortable to, to even talk about it, but um, yeah. So uh, he, so we'll maybe talk about this next week. But you can use the exact same model, pretty much a very similar one to talk about speech. Um, so so you consider circular reactions. Uh, Piaget talks about it, and he got that idea from somewhere else. Um, all babies go through this babbling phase and they're looking at what they're doing. So while the baby's eyes are looking at its moving hands, the baby learns an associative map from its hand positions to the corresponding eye positions. That's this one on the left. Um, and after learning of the map between eye and hand in both directions, that's the other, this is the other way, constitutes the circular reaction. Um, so after map learning occurs, when a baby, child, or adult looks at a target position with its eyes, this eye position can use the learned association map to activate a movement command. So, so the commands now are calibrated with respect to the goal space. In this way, the babble movements endogenously sweep out the workspace within which a baby can reach, and the learned association between looking and reaching that are thereby established can be used to control reaching under volitional control. So it's, it's like learning, well, what can I do? Uh, this, is, this is what these mappings are doing. Have you um, heard of that, um, that interesting uh, situation with babies where, I don't know the exact detail, but they, they took some babies, like really fresh newborns, and they put um, like little tethers uh, onto some, one of their limbs, like on one side, that then had a sound associated with it, like the little rattle on their, let's say, left wrist and their left leg. Mm -hmm. And actually found that the babies, because they could link the random sort of babbling movement with a particular outcome that was really salient, the, the theory was that's why this worked. The, the babies could then control their left side of their body much more um, uh, quickly and effectively than they control the side that didn't have the rattle and the bell on it. And so it was like they're kind of sitting there like randomly like flinging all the way around. But some of the times when they move, there's like this really noticeable change and if you can make that change even more noticeable, they're like, oh, what I was actually doing then by complete accident was moving my arm. But I was just like, you know, randomly, you know, just throwing out noise. But that noise had a, an outcome. And so they've like learned to couple the sensory inputs with the motor outputs, you know, mm -hmm. like in a loop. I just think that's so cool. Yeah. I don't know the in reference fact, for uh, it. In fact, Steve uh, and Dan and, Dan and, and, and Frank uh, Gunther, they talk about this and how attention is really, really important for all of this to happen. And so just like the, the G gain, gain in the motor domain, um, it's very similar to the, uh, these gains in uh, attention. And so uh, this particular uh, mapping, require, like learning the mapping requires that you have a fixed sort of effector that you're looking at. And in fact, the, the su a subtlety of, of, of this, this, this learning is that, um, which is really interesting and, and probably something that all a lot of models need to deal with is that when you're babbling, uh, you need to look at your effector to get the, the correct visual feedback. 
And what that means is that there's not much of a discrepancy between what you want to do and what you, because you don't want anything other than what you are currently doing, right? So what they do is they just use a small time lag between, uh, uh, so you're basically intending to be exactly where you are, but because of a small time lag in this feedback loop, there's a small discrepancy, which is good because you want the learning to be slow. Here's one place where you don't want one shot learning. So you have this tiny, tiny little difference signal, which is basically just what was I doing just now versus what I, where, I, where am I now? And that's good for learning. But then once you've learned and that ran random generator is gone, then you can have pretty large difference signals and they will safely take, um, get projected into the motor command space. So it's, a, it's an interesting uh, issue, which is that when you don't have discrepancies, like, so it's, it's like there's two sides of the same coin, like attention and discrepancies. You need one of the, of the two and ideally both in order to boost learning uh, or, to, or to have something to learn in the first place. So, so even when you're like completely contented, there's a, there's a sense in which your exploration requires a slight discrepancy. Um, uh, so which relates in a way to all, all of this predictive processing stuff, which is that you kind of intentionally need to not quite predict what you're doing if you want to continue to explore and learn. Yeah, so you need a certain amount of surprise. surprise. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so attention and surprise, like what the example that Mac uh, talked about, it relates, right? Because this yeah. slightly unusual salient thing is kind of surprising and draws attention. And then yeah, it feeds the attention. Right, right, right. Yeah. So, so those things operate in loop, you know, errors, attention, and learning, right? They all, they, you, you need like, sort of all of them to kind of be close together. And when you don't have that many errors, the requirements of attention go way up. Um, for learning. And this is just a general kind of thing. I think even in machine learning, they are realizing this. Um, so, Johan, do you think that play in kind of animals is sort of a natural inclination towards engaging this loop? Like when bored, do something rather than nothing that causes you to kind of engage the system to do noisy things that end up causing you to have feedback? I mean, I, I don't know, that's a bit speculative, but it's fun to think about it's yeah. like such a ubiquitous feature. I was thinking about that. You, you shared an article on Twitter the other day and it reminded me how much fun it is to think about yeah. how ubiquitous play is in, in the animal kingdom. It was the Graeber article, Karthik. <laughs> but uh, remember that Graeber article about play? It's a really good article. But yeah. Well, the Baffler one. Yeah, yeah, that Baffler article. I think, well, um, what, was it Mar Margulis or someone, right? The one he refers in that, like play as Kropotkin. Kropotkin is the one he refers Peter Kropotkin, yeah. So, but anyway, yeah. The, but yeah, I think that uh, this exploring your state space is a, is a definitely a part of it. But the twist here that that makes it more like play is that you can't like grab somebody's limbs and shake the hell out of them and expect them to learn anything. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I've tried with my kids; it doesn't work. <laughs> so, 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 um, so yeah, there's there's that there are limits to doing things to somebody for their benefit. You know? um, they have to kind of be a participant. Anyway, so 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 there's just these these simulations are so cool, even though they're so old that 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 um, I just put one simulation here. So once you have a target, once the learning has taken place, you can put a stick like a pointer in the in the hand of this. Without any further training, it can learn uh, to uh, get at the target, which is something that we do perfectly well um, or reasonably well, like depending on uh, how big the pointer is, for instance. But but uh, and then you can constrain the joint so one of the joints can't move, and you can still do it. You, you could smoothly uh, work with the constraints that you happen to have. So um, uh, and it's be, it's because uh, if some particular difference vector, because the difference vector is in spatial coordinates, not joint coordinates, right? So that's just going to keep flowing through, and if the joints aren't doing the job, other other joints will receive the command basically. Uh, and, and you can also create a visual displacement like those, those uh, prism goggles and uh, blind reaching works too. So, so it's a nice set of simulations. It's a very thorough, both these papers are really thorough and they talk a whole lot about existing data. Uh, I mean, if you look at it from the perspective of, of um, you know, reviews in, uh, in the 2000s, they, they are not neural circuits uh, that tell you exactly where each thing is going to happen, but they show that 
many of these types of responses are found in, in motor and premotor areas. Uh, and at, at this stage, they hadn't really gotten into basal ganglia part of the story, which we can maybe talk about. I think in the VEAT, there may be a basal ganglia, uh, sorry, in VIVA, the, the speech model, is there a basal ganglia component in that? I don't remember, but we can maybe talk about that next time. Um, because as- uh, Also, do they talk about the cerebellum? I mean, that seems the most obvious. Definitely that, is a, that is a model where they talk about the cerebellum too. Yeah, uh, John Fiala is uh, really as well. intense. Uh, it uses calcium transients. So that was, I think, the most molecular of all of the Grossbergian models is the, is the Telos model, which is in this chapter too. I can... Diva uses cerebellum too. Diva has cerebellum. Who? Diva, okay. So yeah, so getting all this right is an open issue, right? Because like, as Matt's aware, in fact, someone on Twitter was talking about this issue of, is the basal ganglia involved in movement selection or is it something else? And earlier I would have said, of course it is, but I am no longer super convinced that selection is the right term for what the basal ganglia is doing. Partly it's the stuff that Mac mentioned in his review, but also just thinking about it, right? Which is that a lot of the voluntary uh, uh, movement related um, effects in the basal ganglia are the nucleus accumbens, which is tiny. And you have this huge motor cortex. What's it for, <laughs> if not specificity? Um, so, and, and I was talking to Dan Bullock about this actually, about so, so what is it that um, accumbens represents, right? And it, it, like, because when you, when you read sort of at a sort of vague level about the striatum in general, you might think that you could stimulate the striatum and get a specific movement. In certain situations, you, maybe you can. But in accumbens, you can trigger um, positive orientation, but not to anything specific. It's just positive orientation in general. And then depending on what constraints are available to the animal, it, that positive orientation will sort of latch onto that. So it's really interesting. It's like the pure orientation or aversion. There's this whole uh, affective keyboard even inside the accumbens. So, uh, so obviously there's a lot more real estate in dorsolateral and dorsomedial striatum. So it's, and the fact that those things are involved in habitual behavior means that there's something to the story of specificity, but it may be that it's the wrong question, which is that the specificity, despite the word, actually involves an entire circuit. Uh, and that, you know, different parts of it are contributing at different times or in different ways. Uh, and that if you disrupt one of them, another part of it can just take over the job. Uh, and that type of redundancy is pretty useful. It's another version of this degrees of freedom issue, which is that control of the body is like the most important thing for an animal uh, to like so continue to survive. So locking in, 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 in the natural selection sense, anything that allows the animal to crawl away to live to fight another day, probably a good thing. So I 100% I, I agree with that. I think that a lot of people get really caught up on this notion that a function should live in a particular area, like the basic language should be where action selection is. And maybe a better way to think about it is animals that have an intact basal ganglia are capable of action selection. Um, and it helps them in particular ways to make better decisions or something. And that's maybe less satisfying. And it's a bit more like you might say, oh, what a, you know, why are you being such a nerd about how things are worded? But I think it is important because otherwise the lesions of that structure become a bit hard to understand. Um, so that's the first thing to say. The second is you kind of be a bit careful with the animal literature, right? Because a lot of the play times when these people are studying the basal ganglia and they do beautiful experiments, optogenetic controls, what have you, but you don't, you can't, you shouldn't forget the fact that they've had to train the animals like crazy on these tasks usually beforehand to get them to do anything they want behaviorally. So it's a very different context than an animal that's sort of learning for the first time how to grapple with sensory motor contingencies. It's like, this is a, an expert animal at pushing a button when it wants to get something. And now what you're doing is messing with the, sig the signal that's like doing some high level context about whether or not this is the right time or not, or is the experimenter messing with me, or am I, you know, am I in this sort of, is it a bad day or a good day or something like that? I don't know what's going on in the, in the animal's mind, but it's important to keep those things in, in, in context and, and sort of, you know, it's, an, it's a nuance to the empirical literature that's really frustrating, but it's, yeah. I think you have to take it into account to understand this stuff properly. And I always have this picture in my mind, which I don't know how to fully cash out, of like the unit of interest as some sort of loose, uh, corticothalamostriatal loop and that the competition, the whole loop is competing and it can compete in the sense of local inhibitory mechanisms within cortex or using the TRN or using the striatum and that which, uh, and 
it's almost like you i'm imagining like loops that are like kind of jostling with each other and and where the competition takes place could depend on for instance the the casting vote of say if you've given the animal nothing but reward related information with which to choose then maybe the accumbens and dorsum medial striatum is is the only way to 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 differentiate between uh different courses of action but if there's a much larger set of dif differentiating circumstances which is something that i think pa maybe paul mentioned and and um, kevin mitchell in this uh, louis pessoa's uh, discussion group uh, in highly constrained situations there may not be any other way for the animal to move from one action plan to another but in more you know redundant situations or situations where the animal could do many things uh the casting vote between option a and option b uh, could be quite uh, different. And in fact, now that I think of it, we assume we have this such a strong bias towards optimization-based behavior. The idea of the animal is just nailing some optimization function, but we create tasks where they have to do. Right? So it may be the case that, that, that when there are many options, uh, this cost function framework is, may not be the ideal way to think about it. So, just the, yeah, it, it would I, depend on the context. I, the optimization I, depends on the context. Right. Johan, you're right. Uh, in fact, because people have done all these tasks with optimization in mind one way or the other, you actually are increasingly seeing more people in the motor literature kind of trying to get out of it, like motor decision making and all that stuff. So you, you didn't attend that Bill Newsom talk. If you like look at all the work that people who are associated with Bill, Bill Newsom, whether it's Churchland or Cunningham in, uh, in Columbia or Chennai, all those people, they're like moving into like how like variability is the more important issue rather than like uh, optimizing it for a particular uh, uh, cost function. Like, can I can I make use of the variability in terms of improving the ability to um, make this choice function? So that's why I, what I, I don't remember. He used something like this, something variable. Uh, I forget the name uh, that he used last time. And I, they're, they're definitely moving away from this optimization mode because they're not seeing anything effective. Uh, mm -hmm. And if I remember correctly, Nico can correct me. The whole Shadlin Newsom stuff has been shown by Vince Ferrara and others to be more suboptimal than optimal, right? The whole decision making process. Um, the Shadlin Newsom story of decision making does not work. Yeah. Remind me, uh, what, what is it? I forgot. That's a random dot motion, and then people, and then you have to like say whether it's moving to the left or to the right or whichever direction. And, and and you vary the total number of dots which are moving yeah. in one direction to you know all that. Uh, they say that there is this optimal threshold that you have you cross and then you get this uh, evidence accumulation, right? It's supposed to be yeah, like it's a evidence accumulator. Yeah, what you say has been fighting against that stuff for a decade. Yeah, yeah that's <laughs> drip, drip diffusion in a different. This is not as bad as drip diffusion, but it's still it still doesn't work. I think. Yeah. So their experiment. I think if I remember correctly, Praveen actually showed that it is not optimal in his own modeling work. Okay. And uh, oh, oh, Vince Ferrara, cool. Vince Ferrara did the whole thing and said like it doesn't work that way, right? No, it's not just Vince. Um, uh, so, so the the where you know, so the classic you know Shadlam Newsom story of evidence accumulation and and race to threshold is all done in LIP. Um, and Alex Huck uh, at UT showed that. Um, who was a postdoc with Shadlin showed that you can remove the targets, the signals go away, monkey's still optimal at the task. Wait, what? Uh, remove the targets? Yeah, the monkey knows where the targets are. But you don't mean the dots, the random dots? Oh, no, no, no the targets, not the dots. Oh, just so, like, the, so you have to remember that to... the Shadlin Newsom story is that the evidence accumulation in LIP was at the targets, not at the stimulus. So, wait, what's the target? So, there's these two dots, and then there's like a okay, so, so you have this the field of target. randomly moving dots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you have targets. They can either be colored targets or spatial targets, but they exist sense. in space. Oh, okay. So and the evidence accumulation, the classic Newsom Shadlin, uh, you know, race to threshold neurons. Uh, 
hap are when in, when the receptive field is in the targets. And while Vince has showed in a much more complex way, the story falls apart. Alex Huck just did the very simple thing of making the targets invisible. So you show the monkeys the targets once, then you remove them. Monkey can Ooh. do the task just fine, okay. but the signal in those cells with those receptive fields disappears and the monkey is still optimal at the task. So obviously LIP has nothing to do with the decision-making in that task. Ah, I see, I see, okay, okay. Got it, yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, let me stop the share. Yeah, I'm gonna stop the recording too. And we can, we'll continue this next week, I think. Uh, I, I think we'll talk about the Diva model, which I've never actually read. So.